Let me just start here. So here's the initial slide, disclosures. So as many of you know, the Tendine valve is a transapical 34 French system. Uh, it's anatomically shaped. It's a D-shaped in configuration. Like a lot of these valves, it's got an outer and inner frame. Um, the anchoring mechanism is a tether, which is connected to a hemostatic pad, which sits on the epicardial surface of the heart, which not only anchors uh, the valve in place, but also serves as a hemostatic pad. Uh, and importantly, uh, the tendine valve is uh, completely retrievable uh, and repositionable uh, all the way up until the time that you cut that final tether uh, uh, and leave it in the patient. So here's how it's done. Uh, here in the top left-hand side, you can see a nice X-plane view uh, with TE imaging uh, showing uh, the mitral valve. And it's very important when you're doing these to get a really nice long axis view uh, of the LV because you want to see uh, where the apex is and have a lot of confidence in the apical puncture. Uh, that's unlike your TA tabbers. You have, you have to change your mindset when you're doing TA TMVR. Uh, TA TM, TMVR is different because your apical puncture commits you to the valve orientation. It's very difficult to orient your valve any other way uh, once you've chosen your apical spot. It's unlike aortic uh, valve replacement in which the valve will just self-center. Uh, the mitral valve is much less forgiving. So you can see here in the top left-hand side, uh, if you look at the uh, LV apex, that bright uh, uh, radiolucent uh, spot, is, or radiopaque spot, is actually my thumb pushing on the apex, uh, confirming uh, that we're down the middle, both in the LVOT as well as a bicommissure view. We then puncture, uh, make sure we're not wrapped in the cords, and then the top right-hand side, you can see the tendine valve being extruded. And then the lower left-hand side, a nice uh, 3D view showing uh, the valve in place. And then the lower right-hand side, uh, the final uh, surgical wound, which is incredibly satisfying. Uh, this, this procedure takes about 60 minutes, which I think is really incredible when you think about the fact that the average cross-clamp time for a surgical MVR is often about an hour. And you can do the skin-to-skin -skin in less than 60 minutes, and often... 30 to 45 minutes. I don't think I'd be as fast as uh, Dr. Chung here in 15 minutes, but uh, we, we maybe a little practice. We might get a little close. So the, uh, the feasibility results were published earlier this year, and I've essentially put all the results you need to know uh, on this one page. 30, 30 patients, SDS PROM 7.3%, no procedural deaths. And I think that's a very important fact. Uh, the STS is what it was, but there were no procedural deaths no in-hospital deaths in these 30 patients. And then there were two patients who, who could not be implanted because of their various issues, so the valve was just simply removed, but again, they survived. And then among the patients who did have an implant, there was zero MR uh, and 26 of the 27 mild MR in one of the others. And the success rates overall, if you look at the intention to treat in terms of implant with no residual MR as well as survival, 87%, uh, so for 30-day success. And these results are important because if you look at the patients that are being treated, they're incredibly sick. So look at this LV gram. And I think we can all agree that the MR is quite torrential. The MR is filling up every pulmonary vein you can see, and that LV is barely moving. And I'll tell you, this is actually a case, and um, uh, Richard will remember this very well. We were all looking at each other thinking, oh, boy, uh, is this a good idea or not? Uh, because I think his EF was estimated around 10 to 15 percent on the echo. We were just thinking, boy, this is going to be challenging. But if you look on the right-hand side, 45 minutes later, patient didn't blink an eye, put in the valve, MR is relieved, and now he's back to hosting his radio talk shows uh, in northern Minnesota. And uh, it's incredibly uh, satisfying. So that's that's pretty much where things have been uh, for the Tendine experience. The fees, uh, pivotal studies hopefully will be starting soon. The feasibility studies are ongoing. But I want to give you a glimpse as to what is also possible with Tendine. So this is a 74-year-old woman. She's been in the hospital multiple times for heart failure. She's got severe MR, and she's got really no other significant morbidity uh, besides what you can all see here. And John showed you this earlier, uh, this MAC with this really large anterior uh, spicule on the leaflet. So with uh, the company's blessing, uh, we were able to obtain compassionate use approval uh, for the use of uh, this valve in this patient with uh, severe MAC. And as Myra has led the way for four years, educating us on the possibilities of valve and MAC, we thought that the use of the Tendine 
with its anatomic configuration as well as the atrial skirt will be quite amenable uh, to this patient. And so the FDA gave us uh, compassionate use approval, and again, with the company's blessing, we proceeded to treat this patient. You can see here uh, what we've done. We placed an Agilis catheter in the left atrium. We snared a wire to create a rail. The reason for creating this rail is because we knew we were going to have to balloon that valve. Uh, that valve uh, had a very large spicule, which had to be moved. If, if we didn't move that spicule, the risk was that the tendine valve would not fully expand within the mitral annulus. And knowing that we had to balloon the valve, we wanted the rail so that we could quickly insert the tendine valve if we completely tore it and caused severe uh, MR. And uh, Mara Gessel, who's in the audience here, um, helped me with this. We created the rail. And this is one of those wet your pants moment. So what I did is I gave Mario the inflator, and I said, you inflate. <laughs> and so he, this is him inflating across here. I never thought in my life I would have dilated a valve like this, uh, but that's what we did. And then we put what, in the what valve. What was that? So we used a uh, 228 uh, inaways, and then we also used a uh, true balloon, which was overinflated. Um, and uh, Richard, who was doing the imaging, was convinced that the uh, spicule was moving, and so then we felt confident to go ahead with the, uh, the tendine. And then it was pretty much like uh, the other cases. So if you see the top left-hand side, it's being extruded. The final implant is on the right. And to our amazement, with this patient with incredible severe MAC, there's not a pixel uh, of MR. Uh, and it's uh, really just an in incredible result. And John uh, already showed you some of these images earlier. Uh, it's like the valve was made to fit in this annulus. Uh, if you look at how it sits in there with the MAC, it was a beautiful fit. And uh, we've now done three patients uh, with Tendine for MAC, and I'm very optimistic uh, for this procedure uh, for these patients in whom there really is almost no surgical option, if uh, any. So key points, uh, TMVR uh, with the dedicated prosthesis, it's very feasible. And I, th I like the reversibility, self-expanding uh, mode of these uh, devices. I think that's where the field will be heading for all those devices who are currently not retrievable, and I think we have a lot to look forward to. Uh, thank you very much. So you can get, uh, sit down, Paul, but ask a couple questions. So one is, um, where do you see the role of Tendine versus Sapien in MAC? Because they both obviously have been done yeah. off-label and with, with results that seem you know, interesting. So, Well, if I can get results, it's as, as with Meyer's expertise, I think it's one thing, <laughs> but some of the patients we've had, we've had PVL and, uh, and, and LVAT obstruction. And, and so you haven't had calls. as good an experience. I'm sorry? You have not had as, as, as good an experience yeah, with but, the you know, sapien Yeah, but to be fair, we've only done three sapiens uh, in MAX, and uh, the first one we did very early on in the experience. Uh, the last two were more successful. I think carefully selected, I think it's very advantageous. I think all these devices will go transeptal, transfemoral. Uh, and that's a huge advantage of the Sapien. Uh, and, uh, and, and when these other devices go that route, with their anatomical configuration, the skirts that I think are needed to help prevent PVL, um, it's going to be one or the other in terms of what you see as suitable. So just getting at that, do you think there, there will be any more transapical? Will there be a subset of patients where the I, I think it'll be such that? I think it'll be quite rare. Uh, I, I think it's going to be, um, it's going to follow the same evolution as uh, Tavern, yeah. which uh, Anson has been, was a huge part of moving TA to TF. I mean, it's, if you look at how that field has changed, if you don't have to put a thing through the apex, I think it's going to be better. And I think it's a matter of getting the, the straight segment of these devices to make the turn around the atrial septum, and I think people are solving it. I think it's just a matter of time. Uh, Anson, or is Nessie? No, I, I think it's correct. I think it's eventually it's going to be all transeptal, trans, transvenous. And I think that your tendime is for, for MAC is better, I guess, because of your atrial skirt. And also you have different sizes that, that you have better and bigger sizes than the sapien. And I think you'll be better off uh, using that instead. Yeah, I was going to say the same. So I think there is market for both and perhaps even more technologies. Because with the sapien, you're restricted by the, the, the largest size being the 29. And also, not all MAC patients are like that one. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, I mean, sometimes they, they just start with posterior calcium and there's not enough anchoring. So there are many patients, at least in the trial, that get rejected, not just because of the risk of LVT obstruction, but because of lack of anterior calcium for anchoring. And um, I think there's a significant amount of, of, of those patients who can benefit from a device that has uh, 
that takes care of the anchoring problem. So, so I guess a question related to that is, how, of these patients that you've done, how many of them had actually presented with mitral stenosis with MAC versus yeah. mi- mitral regurg as a primary etiology? Because I think that's obviously a lot different. You need more so, radio force. Yeah, so we, the ones we've sent who have been predominantly stenosis have screened failed. And, and I, I suspect it's because the LV is just not large. Mm-hmm. It's just similar to your sapien experience. You know, if they have MR and, the, and, and their LVs are dilated, then the LVOT is relatively more generous, and uh, they tend to more likely to pass. And so I, all of them have had MR, uh, the ones that we've done. 